If you have your Bible this morning, we're actually going to pause our series in the King of the Kingdom. You can turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read our passage this morning, and then uh, I'll pray for us, and we will uh, see why we're going just a a little bit different this morning. Ephesians chapter 3, actually. I'll be reading uh, just three verses, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 uh, through 12. And I'd ask you to listen carefully. This is God's word. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in, heaven, in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. This is God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus says this never will. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, uh, Lord, carrying a a lot of different burdens and sins and uh, unbelief and and belief in in all the things that you know that are in our hearts right now. And and you know what uh, to do with those things. You you know what to do to to calm us, to encourage us, to uh, fix our eyes on Jesus. And so we're asking, Holy Spirit, that you do what you love to do in your church, that you would lift, lift up Jesus in our presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning and really for the next few weeks, uh, we, we are pausing the King and the Kingdom series as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew together. Uh, and, and if you're new here, this is actually a, a tremendous time for you to, to be here, to kind of get a peek behind the scenes, to kind of uh, see what, what, what we're about, what our vision, values, mission is as a faith family together. Uh, and, and so uh, next week, we, we already talked about, Josh Duncan's going to talk about just our global mission that we have here at Redemption Parker, but, but also uh, what, what we we have here in this room uh, we're going to look at today and then uh, how we can serve and love one another we'll look at in, in a few weeks. But um, a- as everyone in this room, uh, you've had a hard year. <laughs> like, like we've all suffered losses. We've all uh, had difficulties. You've probably had uh, challenges in, in your work and, and otherwise and relationships like it, it is hard. And the, the world that I spend a lot of time in is uh, with pastors. And, and, and what we're seeing is that uh, there is going to be a massive pastoral exodus. There, there, is a, there is a level of burnout. There is a le- level of, man, I'm just done, uh, that, that we have not seen, I have not seen before. Uh, I, actually, I've seen it to some degree. I, I never desired, had any dream to be a pastor in America. When I, when I graduated seminary, we moved overseas, and for 15 years, we thought we would spend the rest of our lives overseas. And the reason I never desired to, to come and, and do what I'm doing right now is because uh, my friends in seminary. Uh, they, they graduated, they, they went into the church, and they, they, got, they just got burned out. They got torn up, they got chewed out, they got spit out. And I said, man, I'm, I don't want anything to do with that. So it was never my intention to, to, to be a part of a church plan in America. But, but by God's grace, he called us here. And three and a half years ago, uh, you were part of planting Redemption Parker. And I mention all that because, uh, uh, to be honest, I- I'm tired. I'm tired in this time, as, as you are. I'm tired pastorally. I'm tired. But, but, but what's been most surprising to me over the last couple months is uh, the way that God has just been opening my eyes and, and doing a, a deepening work in me uh, for you. <laughs> I've never been more loved as a pastor than over the last few months of people reaching out to me, people uh, having coffee with me, people praying, uh, checking in on me. And so thank you for that. And and maybe that's part of uh, God just kind of opening my my eyes to the the value of of you, the the local church, Redemption Parker, you guys specifically. God has been doing a deepening work for my affections and love for this church. And so I just want to say that up front. Like I, I, I love you guys. I love being a part of this church. And I love what God is doing in this place. And, and God has been just opening my eyes to his deep, deep, deep affection for the local church. We in the West have such a way of reading this book through an individualistic lens. Like we'll, we'll put verses that really speak to us on our coffee mugs and our t-shirts. And, and just, it's just, it, it can become a lot about just me and my own personal relationship with God. But when you actually take off those individualistic lens that kind of lead to a consumerist, consumer lens, you start to see that, that God does care for us as individuals, but God is really, really pumped for us as a faith family. 
The metaphors that God uses in the New Testament for what's going on in this moment are kind of astounding and, and repeated throughout the New Testament. Just on repeat, he's talking about the family of God. Uh, that we are, Ephesians chapter 1, adopted sons and daughters into the family of God. That, that speaks of his care and, and tender and, and relationship with us. Uh, another, another metaphor that is on repeat in the New Testament is that you, this, in this room, the people on your left, make up the body of Christ. That that speaks of us being interconnected and dependent on one another. That, that we need each other, that, that I need you and you need me, and, and all of us need to be working together for the body to function. But it also just speaks of his value. We are his hands, his feet uh, to tangibly love the world he's put us in. So we are the body of Christ. The New Testament calls us the, the temple uh, of the living God, the, the living stones. Think about this. The temple was the place where God, in a unique and powerful way, met with his people. But now, in, in, because of Christ, we don't have a Mecca to go to. We, we, we don't go to Jerusalem and expect more uh, presence and power of God. We could go there, and that'd be cool to see where Jesus taught on, on Galilee. But there's no more power and presence of God on the shores of Galilee today than in this room right now. Because we are God's living temple together, built together. The Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. Now, as a dude, I don't love that analogy, but I get it. Like, that speaks of God's tenderness. Uh, it speaks of his love. It speaks of his commitment to his followers. That, that, that together, we are the bride. See, me on myself, I am not the bride of Christ. On, on my own, my, I'm not the body of Christ. On my own, I'm not the temple. And only in, when, when the church comes together are we these things. So, you are your church. I am, we are our church. And as you go, we go. And so uh, I just want to take a moment here because this is a, a special moment for us today. We're going to install a new elder, uh, Ryan Fee, in, in, at the end of this. But I just want to take a moment and just think about and just ponder God's deep, deep affection for, for us together. For you individually, yes, but for what, what's going on in this room right now. It is central to God's purposes. If we see it in, 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 through the lens of just the whole of the New Testament, what is happening in this room and what happens in our gospel communities and in our core groups is central to God's purposes in the universe, we're going to see. And, and so I, I think of John Stott, a, a theologian, pastor. He says this about the church. He says, if the church is central to God's purpose, as seen in both history and the gospel, it must surely also be central to our lives. How can we take lightly what God takes so seriously? How dare we push to the circumference what God has placed at the center? And so my prayer for you and for me th this week is just, Lord, Lord, let us see rightly what, what, what you see when you look on us as your faith family, as your body, as your bride, as your temple. Help us to, to move it back to the center that it should be. And so, if you have your Bible again, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is, is talking to a church. He's, he's writing to a church that he helped plant, the, the church at Ephesus. And, and as he does in his letters to churches that, that are full of Christians, he reminds them of the gospel. Because guess what? Christians need the gospel. We need to be just constantly reminded and remind one another of God's great love for us. And so that's what Paul has been doing for, for three chapters now. And he's been talking about just how God has rescued and redeemed a people. Not just individuals, but a people for himself. And then he says something just uh, absolutely amazing, and I just want to spend some time thinking on it in, in verse 10 as he's rehearsing the gospel. He says, Here, here's the purpose, the mystery of the gospel. Here's what's going on. That, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known. Think about it. I had to look that word up. What, what does that even mean? The manifold wisdom of God. I mean, this, this sounds crazy, but what, what Paul is saying is that unlike any other place in the entire universe, it is w when the church is gathered, w what is going on right here, that, that the manifold wisdom of God is on display. The manifold means the many-sided views of God's wisdom and glory are on display. And so we, we have to ask the question, what is the purpose of the church? What is the church for? And I'm going to say from this passage and, and really the, the whole of the New Testament, it's two things. And every church has to be solid on these things. 
Some of them don't know it, but, but we want to know it. This, this is the whole purpose of why we gather and, and why we scatter. The church exists to display God's glory, and we'll see in a minute, and to minister God's grace. That's why we're here. We, you exist to display God's glory. And Paul is saying, in the church, the manifold wisdom of God is on display. The many-sided views of his glory are on display. How is that even possible? It's a picture of a, of a, a, a majestic gem or diamond with, with lots of different sides. And the church is the ring and the prongs that holds it up. The point is not the, the ring so, so much, but, but the holding up of this beauty, beauty and glory and grace. That's our role as a church, to hold up the gospel. You say, well, this is kind of crazy because it's not just in the world. Look, look what he says. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is a cosmic display. This is, this is angels and demons and all creatures in all the universe, if there are other ones, uh, that are to look on and, and behold the church. And they are stunned. They are shocked. They're like, man, God is glorious. Look at Redemption Parker. Isn't God glorious? And some of us are, are thinking, well, I, I mean, I don't know about that. Like, I think there's other, there's other ways that God could put on display his glory. I mean, the mountains do a pretty good job. And, and doesn't the Bible say that? And, and the stars and the moon and, and, and the galaxies, like, they, they, they seem to be, they don't seem, like, the church seems kind of like a messed up place. The church kind of seems like, there's, there's better places for you to put the gym than, than on the ring of the church, God. But think about this. Well, what, is it, what, what is it that we're doing right now? What, what is happening in this moment that, that brothers and sisters are gathered, people that wouldn't otherwise be in a family, people that wouldn't otherwise be friends, were, were gathered, and, and Paul has, has told us some things, that before eternity passed, he planned that you and I, if you put your faith in Christ, have been predestined to be part of the family of God. You and I have been rescued and redeemed. You and I were rebels before a holy God. Ephesians chapter 2 says, you and I were dead in our sins and trans transgressions. Well, we had nothing but wrath that we deserved come to us. And now we are gathered as a rescued, redeemed people, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ. And God is saying, he, this church, Redemption Parker, and all the local gatherings of my saints are a, a symbol, a, a jewel of my grace to the universe. So, don't, so let's not think small of what God thinks large of. Like, like it, is the, it is the central place on the, in the universe right now where God is setting his affections. He is saying, I love these people. Like, but God, like, we have masks on and some people use that as an excuse not even to sing. And uh, he's like, no, I love these people. But, but sometimes we, we come in here half-hearted that doesn't matter. I rescued them. I redeemed them. They're part of my family. But God, they're, they're, they're sinful. They're, they, they still mess up. I know you've forgiven them. Yes, I've forgiven them. Not only that, I've given them my righteousness. So I just see the jewel that they are. And so the church exists to put on display the manifold wisdom of God, the glory of God. And not just that, the church exists to... Uh, Minister the grace of God. It's verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that, has, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is according to the gospel. That God had a plan. He knew we would rebel. He knew that, that our hearts would be turned. He knew that we didn't deserve anything from him. But in his plan, he sent his son Jesus, perfect in obedience to the Father, and thought, word, and deed, went to the cross. And on the cross, he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In that moment, we received uh, what, what the Bible is going to call justifying grace. We were justified and made declared righteous in his sight. This happens in the church and through the church. There's no other institution on the planet or in history that, that can do what only the church can do and, and be the tool for bringing dead people to life. This is why I'm not going to be so upset about whatever happens in November. Because no government, no education, no, no other institution can do anything of eternal significance. Only what's happening right here, right now, and across the globe in like gatherings. This changes eternity. 
Because Jesus has predestined it to, to empower us, to, to give us justifying grace. But in this moment, there is also sanctifying grace. You have been saved by grace. You will be sustained by grace. In the end, you will get into heaven and, and, and fully join the, the family of God by grace. And so we administer justifying grace. We preach the gospel to people and invite them into the family of God. We administer sanctifying grace. We preach the gospel and we are reminded that the Spirit lives within us and, and delights to do His work through us. It says, in whom, we, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. Now we have boldness and access. We were enemies of God. Now we're not just friends of God. We're family members. And like little children who always can come into the, the household of the king, we have an open door and we get to go with him at all times. So if this is true, then let us not push what, this off to some secondary thing. That there is a profound eternal thing happening every time we lift our praises. There's a profound and eternal thing when we pray together. There's a profound and eternal thing happening when we remember Christ's broken body and shed blood. So I just want to say, in light of that, give yourself to the church. Give yourself to the church. The, 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 best, the, the best way to describe this comes from Charles Spurgeon in the late 1800s. He says this. It's a long quote, so I won't have it on the screen. It says this. Give yourself to the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect, and I hope that you feel almost glad that you have not. If I had never joined a church till I found one that was perfect, I would never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it, for it would not have been a perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, listen to what he says. This is so true. Still, as imperfect as Redemption Parker is, it is the dearest, dearest place on earth to us. It's the dearest place on earth. The manifold wisdom of God is on display when brothers and sisters gather and lift God's praises and remember his grace. He says this, all who have, given, have first given themselves to the Lord should as speedily as possible also give themselves to the Lord's people. How else is there to be a church on the earth? If it is right for anyone to refrain from membership in the church, it is right for everyone. And then the testimony of God would be lost to the world. As I've already said, the church is faulty, but that is no excuse for you not joining it if you are the Lord's. Nor need your own, your own faults keep you back, for the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace. You can say amen to that. Thank you. Saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are still sinners and need all the help they can drive from the sympathy and guidance of their fellow believers. The church is the nursery for God's weak children where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold for Christ's sheep, it is the home for Christ's family. So again, if you're just visiting, we're, we're so glad you're here. Hey, if you're checking out, like we hope that whether it's Redemption Parker or one of the, the many, many great churches that are gathered together, the local expressions of the body in our city, uh, we hope you find a place that you can give yourself to and, and just trust that God's wisdom is on display and that God knows best that though it's not flashy and, and maybe we don't have a fog machine and lasers, God is still at work in his church. So give yourself to the church. And so as far as it is possible for us, we, we've tried to uh, provide, a, a lay down the tracks for you to connect and commit. Connect and commit. There, there's a few I just want to go through. I, I don't even know what order I have them on. So a few ways to connect and commit just coming up here. So we're going to have baptisms and a party in the park. So we, we haven't been able to do that for a while, but, uh, and we're not going to do it here. But after church on October 4th uh, at Paper Flower Park, we think, we're tr still trying to get that reserved and some food trucks, we're going to have a party. This is just a way for us to enjoy one another without masks on. And so uh, if you haven't been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus, 
then just in obedience and for your joy, uh, we would invite you to do that. Come talk to one of the elders and we'll walk you through that. Uh, next way to connect is through Coffee Connection. If you're just checking out the church, every four to six weeks, we try to provide an, an, a smaller venue in, in our home where you can come out and meet some of the leadership and just hear more about the heartbeat and vision and values of Redemption Parker. Uh, next, we, we have uh, gospel communities. As you think about it, sometimes that's a, a scary step, but, but our way that we kind of do life on life together, our way that we provide accountability, belonging, and care, which every believer needs. And it, by the way, in the moment that you need accountability, belonging, and care, if you don't already have it in place, it's too late. If you don't have accountability in place and you need some accountability, it's too late. If you need a place to belong, you need some care, and you don't have those people that are going to love you and surround you, it's too late. And so the way we do that is through our gospel communities. And, and these are just uh, groups where we, where we get together, share a meal, pray for one another, open the word together. Uh, and then from there, we, in two weeks, we're going to have our Strategic Servant Sunday. You know, we, we, need, we figured it out. We, we need about 31 spots filled on every Sunday for, for this to happen. And they're, they're not hard. Uh, they're, they're quite easy. And sometimes uh, people take three or four or five, six of them on a Sunday. But nevertheless, uh, in two weeks, we're, we're just going to help lay those out and encourage you, especially our members, to, to find a place to, to commit and to serve. And then finally, uh, we believe in covenant membership. We believe that Christ has, has covenanted with us by his blood. He has purchased us and, and he has made us a, a family uh, that, that loves one another. And so because he's covenanted with us and reconciled us to him, he's also reconciled us to each other. And so we make covenant commitments together. And, and you can go online and go to our membership thing and pull up the packet and see what, what that entails and what we believe and, and what we're committing to. You might be asking, well, what are you committing to us if we decide to do that? Um, excellent question. Because today we get to, uh, and Ryan, I'll even invite you to come up here right now. We get to uh, install a new elder. And in, in the installation of the elder, Ryan's going to make eight commitments, eight covenant commitments to the members of Redemption Parker. So, so elders, maybe you come from a church that didn't have elders. It's just our attempt to, to read the New Testament and be biblical. And, and elders are not to rule over people like some sort of Jedi council. It, it is really just a, an invitation of, for someone to get as low as possible, to wash the feet of the people of Redemption Parker, to serve them. And, and just know that Ryan has prayed for you. Uh, the reason he's standing up here now, he's gone through our elder process. But even before that, he has a deep love for this church. He has a deep love for, for just praying for you guys, for encouraging you guys. You, you've heard him teach. And so elders simply just lead, feed, serve, guide, protect the sheep. And so it's not a way to rule over you, but to come uh, beneath you and serve and lay down the tracks for you to do the ministry God has called you to. And so with that, I'm going to uh, ask you some questions, Ryan. I'm going to ask you some questions regarding uh, your covenant commitment so these people can see what it is an elder is committing to for the members of Redemption Parker. So there's eight of them. And you can just respond in kind if you do commit. If not, we've messed up. Um, all right, number one. Ryan Fee, do you commit to lovingly care for our covenant members and seek our growth in Christ? Do you commit to provide biblical, gospel-centered teaching from the whole counsel of God's word? I do. Do you commit to helping our covenant members in times of need as needs are made known? I do. Do you commit to, to meet the criteria assigned to elders in the scriptures? I do. Do you commit to pray for our covenant members, particularly when we are sick? I do. Do you commit to pray for our covenant, oh, sorry. Uh, do you commit to exercise church discipline when necessary for our restoration, joy, and unity within the church? I do. Do you, do you commit to seek God's will for our church to the best of your ability to study the scriptures and follow the spirit? I do. And finally, do you commit to set an example with your life and join us in fulfilling the duties of a covenant member? I do. Amen. Well, I want to invite our other elder, uh, Brad, up. You might have to grab a microphone here. Pray for Ryan, and then I'll hand it over to him. Thanks, brother. Thanks. So again, in a non-COVID world, we would have the members come up and, and lay hands on you and pray for you. So um, just in your spirit, lay hands on him and uh, join us in praying. Here, why don't you come to the room? That's a big list. Yeah. 
This is your last chance. <laughs> I'm scared of that list. So. Amen. Will you guys pray with me? God, uh, thank you for Ryan. Thank you for his heart to serve you um, and his heart to serve the church, God. Um, I know we joke about it, but that is a, that is a big list, as Mark said, uh, to get low and serve the people here and commit to that. Um, it is a hard task, and so I pray that you give him wisdom and discernment, energy, um, and that continued passion to serve you in that way, God. Um, that he would know to serve your church, God, because it is worth it. You are the, the church is the bride of Christ, God, and, and that is of eternal value that is worth it, God. I thank you for his heart of just showing his eldership qualities over the past year um, and just proving himself um, to be one that can serve in that capacity, God. And again, we just pray for him as he this time, protects him, protects his family um, as he takes on this role, God. In Jesus' name, amen.